Welcome to the show. We hope you have a blast. Thanks for making time for the Dealer Talk Podcast. Another business leader, here's a penny for your thoughts. This ain't a regular conversation, baby. This that Dealer Talk. Yeah, this that Dealer Talk. What up? Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Season 7, Episode 6. Super, super excited to be here with all of you. Let's check in with our co-host, Miss Charity Ann. Charity, what's up? What is up? Happy podcast day. I'm excited. We're talking to right Steve Showers today. Yes, super excited to talk to him. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of perspectives. I'm sure we're going to talk about your favorite subject, EVs. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, no, this is awesome. It's going to be a good conversation for sure. Um, so what is going on? How are things? Um, going on vacation today. Oh, shoot. Yeah, yep. that's right. Mm-hmm. Excited? I am super excited. Very cool. We won't say where you're going, but no, it's pretty awesome. Um, uh, how, how did your meeting go this morning? Was it a good meeting? Your Friday morning meeting? Yeah. So we did a group wide meeting and we talked about teamwork and creating a unified experience for our customers. It was great. That's awesome. One Very of the managers cool. said something really, I felt like it was really profound. Um, you can be as intense as you want to be, but you can't be mean. I like, I like that. Because I'm like kind that. of an intense person and it comes across as being mean a lot. So. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely tact, which I don't have. That's probably one of my biggest, uh, my biggest issues that, that I, you know, the biggest feedback I get, like sometimes I'm just like, I'm too direct is what I get, which I think that's a good thing, but a lot of people don't. So I I like that. That's a good one for sure. I like that one a lot. Yeah. So anyways, lots to cover. Let's kick things off with some automotive news. Automotive news for today. Since Herb has forbade me from doing automotive news on EVs. Well, no, let's clarify that. <laughs> let's clarify. That. If it's something that's like super relevant and critical, then obviously, you know, let's bring it out to, to the audience. But if all we talk about is EVs, I mean, there's so much other stuff happening. So there is a lot of, if you just look up, you Google automotive news, the first things that pop up are EVs. You have to dig sure. for anything other than them, but I got a yeah. good one. What you got? Well, it's kind of, it's not fun, but I kind of find it comical as usual. Um, Kia and Hyundai are struggling right now. First of all, they just recalled 280,000 vehicles. Um, it says that they have told the owners that they should park their vehicles outdoors and away from uh, buildings because the trailer hitch wiring can on the Palisades and the Tellurides can catch fire. Whoa. Yeah. All right. So that's not a good one. Didn't we talk about it's better than your car catching on fire in one of these episodes or your car exploding? (laughs) That's not a good problem to have. (laughs) <laughs> I just really, really love when the article starts with this company has suggested you don't park your vehicle inside. Like to be in the press free or the press meetings at Kia or Hyundai when they try to make that sound less bad. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I can only imagine what those conversations are like. Yeah. <laughs> the other part that I think is interesting is how long everybody waited for the Tellurides. Like, and now they're recalling them. 36,000 of them. But that's not the only thing that Kia and Hyundai are struggling with right now. What else? Um, so on TikTok of late, I don't know when it came out, but somebody posted a video on TikTok of how to 
um, hotwire the Kias and the Hyundais because they don't have an engine immobilizer in them and they still have mechanical keys. And so somebody with a USB cord and a flat head screwdriver, you can hotwire these cars. And somebody wow. posted it online and St. Paul, Minnesota has seen an increase of car thefts by 1300%. Chicago, Get out of here. 800%. Wow, that's nuts. It's to the Get point where... That's there's... how not to use social media. That's, <laughs> that's a wrong way of using social media. I know, right? That's Freaking insane. Poor Kia, man. man wow, wow, wow. They're having a rough quarter. But yeah. somebody filed a class action lawsuit against them, stating that it was too easy to break into their car and if they had known that they wouldn't have bought the car oh come on like people like geez really that's what you're gonna do ah oh, that's insane so um going back to the recall issues though it's interesting i wonder how much of it is just new technology and new new makes and you know the process of getting those cars to production and if this is just a, a a very hypothetical if, but if 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 the situation, the pandemic has anything to do with with um, some of these recalls that we're seeing now, is it because we had less people? Is it because you know production was halted, or you know what I mean? Like I wonder how much of the lower quality options because of supply chain issues. Yeah, I just wonder if we're going to see more of this trickling down the chain, so to speak. You know, right now, obviously, it's it's just hard to get inventory as it is. But I wonder how, how if right again the, that hypothetical if we're going to see more of these issues down the down the pipeline just because of situations that arise during the pandemic. Um, one of the other things that I was reading was talking about the increase in catalytic converter thefts and how that's just been because of the pandemic that people started stealing those oh yeah i um i've talked to a lot of general managers and stuff at d uh, d uh, different stores that um have seen a lot of theft of that in their in their lots so um yeah that's pretty interesting but yeah i mean with i mean if you just think about we will already have challenges with inventory and now we have to face these potential i'm not trying to alarm or you know say things here that um without any any basis but um, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll just be interesting to see how that, how that impacts us, you know, later on, if any, so, if at all. Yeah. I have one here that I wanted to talk about because it's in the marketing realm and it's one of the things that I, that I really like doing because I find it to be really effective and that's the, um, ringless voicemails. So I really liked how effective that, the, the that has been um i used it a lot in my last uh you know company job when i was with gsm is that uh, the the i've used that before haven't i where it just leaves a voicemail on their phone just leaves you a voicemail and it's you know it just um wh whatever information you want you want to say like I, just you record it beforehand and then okay yeah i've used that before right Those are so cool. on the service side on the service side that's super effective or we saw some pretty um uh pretty good conversions on those um which always seemed a little bit interesting to me and especially now because it seems like less people like i never check my voicemails like my inbox has to be full and then i'll go through them but um we did see a lot of uh, uh positive results with that strategy and i wonder two things one um is it really going to be because according to this it says that uh, the legal consensus based on numerous court decisions is that ringless voicemails are illegal without prior consent, which, I mean, I kind of understand it from the customer perspective. If you didn't, if you didn't authorize it or even unknowingly authorized by signing a form or something, and they just do that, it's kind of weird. Um, and even if they did, it's kind of weird because you're not, you don't know that you gave consent, but, um, how many dealers have these? Um, hold on, let me finish this thought and I'll, uh, how many dealers have these services turned on that might not even know about it? And if there is regulation that comes on the, 
you know, kind of like the, the, the chain of command, so to speak, and it impacts your dealership, then you could potentially be exposed to fines. So you have to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, your marketing director or your marketing manager, or if you have a vendor manager or somebody that's, you know, paying attention to all these different solutions needs to really investigate and do his due diligence or her due diligence to make sure that you're not uh, exposed, right? Because I, I, some of these fines are ridiculous, 15 grand per occasion or something like that. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Anyway, I'm sorry. I know you had a thought. What is the harm that's caused by a ringless voicemail? Like I understand a text message because that can cost money, but it doesn't cost money for me to get a voicemail. So I wonder what their argument for the harm is. Well, I, I suspect this, it's like the same thing as getting a text message, right? You, um, well, but that's the thing you, the reason that they can argue that you can't do that is because it can cost you money. An SMS text might cost you money. So yeah, I privacy, this is, I mean, I know that there's, that's, that's part of it, right? There's, and, and that's less and less of a, of a, um, of an argument, I would say in these days, because most people have unlimited or whatever. So, you know, that argument is but like, like, even with this, the lawsuit is that there has to be a harm caused. I think it, there's a, there's invasion of privacy, right? The customers don't know they haven't in their mind. Let's say that they did consent because they filled out a form somewhere and it says, Hey, by signing this form, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so that's your out. But to the customer, that has to be super annoying and even big brotherish, right? Like, how did they get my phone number? Why did they leave me this message? All these different things. Especially, let's say that it's a dealer that doesn't, that you don't do business at. Or maybe you bought a car five years ago, but you never serviced it there. Or maybe you, you bought a car or you took it in for a recall, never purchased a car, and now they're sending you a special message and i don't know I, like i mean this is a very is high level comment. dealerships or is it because i get a lot of voicemails for stupid your warranty has expired or do you yeah want it could to be sign up for this what do they call those things uh timeshares yeah mm -hmm. so anyway I I mean, that's, just, that's one that i would uh you know just you know, again, whoever is managing that stuff at your dealership, you got to pay attention to that. You don't want to be exposed. Oftentimes you have these services turned on. You don't even know that they're turned on. And if nobody's paying attention and looking at that, that could be, that could be a problem. Because so. that's what happened with me. I didn't know that I had a ringless voicemail for a while. Um, and then I had a customer say, Hey, I got a voicemail from you. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i don't remember leaving this person a voicemail <laughs> yeah but then i wondered where like i didn't remember recording it at all yeah i mean you just got to pay attention man you don't want to you don't want to get those like, fines probably the first six months of being a manager too so yeah i'll give myself that little bit of a loophole <laughs> here's another one that i i'm yeah, i'm gonna break my own rule but this is funny and it's and I think it, it's, a, it's a good one to, to mention. So the headline is, Will Dodge's EV fake roar polarize V8 fans? <laughs> so will the artificial sound of the Charger Daytona uh, generated by an amplifier and uh, tuning chamber at the rear help Dodge convert consumers into believers of battery power muscle or repel them? Ladies and gentlemen, is this going to be like the dialogue that we have? The undertone for the entire season is going to be you and I arguing about the noise on a charger. <laughs> I'm totally going to find somebody that's like a muscle car enthusiast and we're going to have this conversation with them. Yeah, I mean, I, again, here's, here are my thoughts. I, um, I think for some people that are used to the, the imperfections of ice, and I mean like the rumbling and the, that mm -hmm. whole thing, that's going to be, it can be 
weird and almost a turnoff, right? Because I don't think that it's just an, a noise factor. And I drive an electric vehicle and they're, they're smooth, man. Like you cannot, like, it's just a different feel. I think the best explanation um, I heard from Paul Daly on uh, Michael Cirillo's po podcast, uh, the dealer playbook, um, where he says, it's not a car, man. An electric car isn't a car or a Tesla. I think he, 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 you know, talked directly. It's an appliance. It just doesn't feel like a vehicle. And um, that could be a differentiator for a lot of dealers out there that are, um, how do I say this, that are um, trying to, you know, not reinvent themselves, but create a differentiator of, of sorts. And I think like the, 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 you know, that brand like CG, CG, CJDR, geez, um, that brand in particular has the biggest um, advantage mm -hmm. when it comes to that on the, with their product line. I mean, they got the Jeeps and that's, that's a culture um, trucks, you know, that, yeah, right. Jeep owner right there. Um, <laughs> Which so, um, I'll interject right here. I am actually on the side of a sound really like posers. That's like, <laughs> that's what we're well, going to do. You're going to, you have a sound. Ooh. But then here, they, I, I, I read an article too. I mean, going back to, to your, to your, to the Jeep thing, right? I read an article that said that uh, Jeep full electric Jeeps were they're pushing to have them available in 2024. Mm -hmm. I so, I mean, are you going to be able to go, you know, rock crawling and do all the things? I, I don't know. I mean, it's that all that stuff needs to. There's just so many questions, right? Because you don't know it until you get in it and you drive it. Um, so anyway, that was, a that was one. Was the job back at me? No, not really. It's just, uh, maybe a little, <laughs> we'll see. Time will tell. Um, and then another one here that I thought was pretty interesting, um, that has nothing to do really with, with, with dealerships, but, but it was a fun one that I read had to do with, uh, Automotive companies leveraging autonomous technology for delivery of uh, delivery robots. So um, basically taking um, technology from autonomous cars to to like Amazon, for example, is one that's uh, experimenting with that to create um, robot delivery. Oh, like pizza with, delivery with a robot. Well, yeah, but I think it's more about it's more of an Amazon thing. Like, you know, at one point they were, they were, uh, they had this idea and they tested it and actually did a couple of deliveries with like, uh, these drones that would, and I think in some places they still do it like drones carry your package and then they, they drop it right in your drawer and they fly off or whatever. So I think it's something sort of like that. Uh, but that'd be, I guess my biggest takeaway from that is how cool is it that this technology that's, in the automotive space is, uh, is trickling down into other areas and could potentially have, um, an impact. I mean, can you imagine if it becomes a thing and now everything gets delivered because it would be way cheaper and it just makes sense and everything's delivered that way. And it's all started because of the endeavor. That reminds the, me of well, we were talking what last week when we were trying to figure out how big the, how many employee people were employed with the automotive industry. Do what was the residual employment? Do you remember it was like it was in the millions to something? Two well, just million. the employment was 1.7 million, but then the residual employment was like 8 million or something. Off was it that up. high? I thought it was like three. Mm. But maybe it, it would total. Make it may be total. It was like I mean, it would make sense. Like if you take an OEMs, for example, and assembly mm -hmm. lines and all that stuff, like it's a lot of people. Or so. like even foam made for seats, you know. Yeah. Or the delivery services for the automotive industry. It's a big, it's a big thing. This industry. Just a it little. It sure old. is. <laughs> um, let's see. Anything else here that I had seen worth mentioning? 
Oh yeah, here the uh, Dodge dealerships to pay nine hundred thirty-five thousand in EEOC discrimination claims. So that's a that was a big one too. Tell me more. Um, well, the excerpt here is um, I don't want to say because I don't want to name any but any dealership in particular here, but um, a dealership in Colorado agrees to pay nine hundred thirty. Five thousand related nine hundred thirty-five thousand dollars in claims related to gender discrimination brought by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I'm not going to get into specifics. The reason why that one was interesting to me is because in the times that we're in right now, and we have like I've talked to a lot of dealerships where people are leaving, they're uncertain about the industry. Um, there's opportunity now to work from home. There's all these different things happening. Um, you know, from an employee standpoint, I think it's critical to look internally and make sure that we're doing everything to uh, create better working environments and making sure that we can not just retain the people that we have, but invite people that normally wouldn't even consider our industry, um, which is one of the big pushes that we've had here mm -hmm. at the podcast, like to get people to join us, um, on purpose sort of a deal oh, yeah. and not just fall into the industry. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a big one right now in this climate and who knows, man, I mean, look, I'm, I don't want to be doom and gloom, but you know, the financial situation doesn't look great. Another interest uh, hike. And that means even more difficulties putting people in cars. And, um, obviously those that that's going to impact, um, the bottom line. So we have to be, we just have to do better at creating a, a, a uh, an environment that that fosters growth and um, development and people staying in this industry and wanting to join the industry. So, you know, I just had this. We've talked a lot about the everybody the falling into the industry, and then we you couple that with the COVID babies, the sales guys that have started during. COVID, I had an interesting conversation with a sales guy yesterday. <clears throat> he figured out, and this is, we use VIN at work. And um, I would, without any ego, would confidently say, I know that, can, that CRM better than almost everybody in the building. And he figured out how to because they're pretty restricted on the sales guys are restricted on what they can see. And he figured out how to find all of the opportunities that were in the BDC's name. And he started calling them. And um, one of the BD agents caught it because he had called over the top of her on a customer and told the customer that it wasn't worth their time to come into the building. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So BD agent just loses her mind, right? So I have to go deal with it. And the sales guy's argument was, I have to sift through all of this junk to get anything good because it's getting rough out there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's like, and I have to be able to make this much money in order to feed my family. And I was like, oh, here we go. It's starting. Yeah, but that's, that's, you know, you're not the only person in that space, right? right? Like if you're in that situation, the guy next to you is in that situation too. Right. So that's kind of a dick move in my opinion. Oh, yeah, totally. And that's what I said to him. I was like, okay, but listen, like you only compound issues when you do things like that. Right. And, or you could be working with them instead of against them, but watching the panic in his eyes when he tried to explain why he had done it. And in the argument of, well, I've made all of this money over the last two years. And now all of a sudden it's harder to make the money. And I'm like, Oh, oof. it's coming. Yeah. It's I coming mean, for it's sure. Like, but you know, that that's the kind of stuff. And I know we're getting on a tangent, but we have time. So, and it's my <laughs> show. So, um, uh, that's the kind of stuff that kind of pisses me off, especially right now, like talking to the to to decision makers. It's like, oh, my gosh, like, what are we going to do? We're not selling cars and things are slowing down and all this stuff. Dude, 
And when two years ago, when you were making bank, mm -hmm. did you forget that? that all of a sudden that, you know, like you knew that that was not a real sustainable environment or reality, right? You yeah. knew that, but because you're in the good times and the money's rolling, then we, you know, we forget, we forget that there's going to be a tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes and it smacks you in the mouth, you're like, oh shit, you know, now it's real. Um, yeah. yeah, but come on, like, dude, like we and knew this was coming and it's here. So, and it's I, here I and it's starting and you're starting to see like just the, just the hints of it, the echoes, the whispers of it around the dealership and anybody who's been in the business for even a little bit of time, I would say that we're all kind of going, Oh. Yeah, but we had great times. If we didn't prepare for this, shame on us, right? right? We had great times, unprecedented, record-breaking times on units in some cases or in a lot of cases, and pretty much everybody on gross and profit. So, I mean, like, it, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Like, we're going to go through what we're going to go through. This is what needs to happen to kind of stabilize things in the economy and uh, uh a strong economy benefits all like mm -hmm. we can't have an economy with, I think the last inflation number I saw was like 9%. I think the worst it ever got was in the eighties and it was like 12 or 14%. Can you imagine paying 12% on a, well, that wouldn't be mortgage rates, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. I'm not an economist, so I don't know, but, um, 12 it's just, more on milk. Yeah. But I mean, you're paying it like the, the, the most expensive kind of money is free money. Right. And we got a shit ton of it during COVID. So, I mean, now we got to we got to pay the price. It's, the it's just most what it is. The most kind of money is free money. Well, yeah, of course, because we have. That, to, is that know. a quote? Yeah, from me. It's I just said thing. it right now. I've never heard um, that before. But it's true. It's I mean, you true. think that when when the government starts printing money and giving money to people and, oh, yeah, we got all this free money. Like, it's not free, man. Like, you're going to have to pay for that. What, do you think that, that what how, how does the government make money? They well, right. You. But again, that goes back to the lottery winner blog post that we talked about. Like, you think that you have a windfall and you don't realize the constant that you're just at the right place at the right time and you really have nothing to do with that situation you just got lucky and that's really what it came down to folks anybody high-fiving themselves during these times yeah there's some dealers that thought outside the box and capitalized an opportunity and i'm not i'm not trying to generalize or take anything away from anybody but dude come on like i we had this one month um six months ago where my 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 BD agents had just worked so relentlessly hard to get customers in. And the, it was funny because the sales floor was all high-fiving themselves on how, oh my gosh, we had such a record month. And I, I jokingly said in a manager meeting, and meanwhile, in the back, the entire BDC department is like slumped over in their chairs, exhausted from the amount of effort that they just put in to get those people into the building. And the sales guys are all like, woohoo, we did so great. And they know, don't yeah. realize the effort that goes into getting those people, which is the conversation they had with the sales guy. I said, my agents make 120 to 200 calls a day to get you X a number, X amount of number, X amount of appointments. That's a, a lot, lot of work. Like, that's yeah, a lot of work sure. that you don't see going into this. And then you walk in and you're like, well, that's not going to work. So I'm going to do it my way. And they get paid pennies on the, on their, on, on the, the dollars. dollars. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Pennies on the dollars that the sales guys make. There is nothing that will make me jump out of my seat and go toe to toe with a sales guy as fast as them coming into my office and yelling at one of my agents that, you just lost me $400 because you talked to this customer wrong. Like, that'll piss me off fast. And I've said that I had one sales associate say to one of my agents, you took money out of my mouth because you talked to my customer. And I said, I never want to hear you talk to my agents like that again. 
you have no idea the amount of work that goes into the pennies that they make for your dollars. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, so that's it for automotive news. Uh, let's talk about our blog post of the week. Blog post of the week. Um, this one's kind of yours. This is your baby. The You had a little bit of a run-in with a vendor that you struggled with. Yeah, so here's the deal. Vendors, cut the crap, man. Cut the shit. If you're charging dealers or trying to lock dealers into contracts, shame on you, right? Like you got to earn that shit every single month. Every single month you should be earning that business. And if you get into a situation where a dealer says, listen, man, it's not for me. It just didn't deliver what I was expecting. Then don't revert back and be like, well, there's this specific clause in this contract that says if you don't put the cancellation in by this particular day, then you're locked in for a year. Like that's just not right, right? And shame on on, on the dealers, uh, you know, on myself in this particular case, because I'm the one that got screwed in this deal for not checking everything. But I mean, seriously, who sits there? I mean, let's just be real. Do you really read every single contract that you get? Do you really go line by line? No, you don't. Um, most of the dealerships that I've worked with or worked in never do that. Like what you have a legal department standing by and you're like, Hey man, wait a second. I'm going to send this contract over. I know some of them do, but for the most part, it's like, you know, a, a gentleman's agreement. Like I tell you exactly like this particular situation, I invited this vendor into this group. We pitched it or let them pitch to a GM who was hesitant because he had already heard the pitch and wasn't really convinced. They signed on on my say so because I recommended them. I told them I was very specific. I said, "Listen, we don't sign contracts. We don't sign contracts. So if we're going to do this deal, it's going to be on a thirty day basis." Now, some of the products included SEO, which, by the way, I don't I don't stop anything that is SEO related in uh, six six months or longer because it takes time to build that stuff, and I get it. I understand how it works. But as soon as we get to that six month mark, if it's not moving in the right direction, then it's not moving in the right direction. So let's just shake hands and 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 move and you know have an opportunity to be partners in the future or partner up on different on different accounts or maybe you develop a product and that is something of interest later on. But now what you've done is you close the door forever, right? Um, I was really going to just flat out say the name of the company because I don't, I really don't want any other um, dealerships to get screwed by this organization, but I'm going to refrain from doing that because, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not about bashing companies, but if you want to know who it is, DM me, send me a message, call me and I'll share it with you. Um, but do not, do not um, lock yourself into a situation where, um, these vendors are handcuffing you to doing business with them because if they're not moving the needle for you and they're not getting stuff done, then you need to, you need to be able to move on and go to the next person or go to somebody else or, you know what I mean? It's just a terrible practice. And then here's the worst part of it all vendors. When you do this, it's so obvious that it's just about money for you. It's so obvious that you're trying to, well, you have this, these quarterly projections. And when you say, oh, well, I got to talk to the CFO, that's, a, that's, that's it. At that point, I already know it's not about partnership. You don't care about helping the dealership. You only care about your bottom line. And that's wrong. It shouldn't be like that. It should never be like that. You should earn that business every single month. The other thing that I think was, is important is that I find that some vendors, if they don't get the answer they want from one of the management team, they'll just go to another manager. So as the management team, you guys need to be communicating and that what's going on with these different vendors. Just to, just today, I had a, a vendor call me because they didn't get the answer that they wanted from my GSM. And I was like, if you talk to him, that's game over. Like, sorry. He's yeah. Well, 
it was a similar situation because they sent me the contract, right? And I was like, listen, I'm not going to, I send it back. I said, I'm not signing this because it, we don't do, we don't do agreements. It's 30 days. And then he went to the general manager and because it, they had sent it to me, the general manager of the store got it and signed it because he thought it, I had vetted it and it was done. He didn't, he didn't know of all these different clauses that they had hidden in the deal. And so, um, you know, I just, I hate that. I hate vendors who, who handcuff dealers. And then when their services don't provide a benefit, then they want to go back to the contract and they're like, well, there's this clause in the contract, or I got to talk to my CFO. Yeah. You got to talk to your CFO because you're not going to hit your quarterly projections. If we, if we turn the faucet off right now, and that's more important to you than, than your relationship with the dealer. And that's just, it's so wrong. So, and it, and it just drives me insane. Well, and then it, and then the word vendor becomes a, a four letter word. Right. And I hate, I, you know, because I used to work for Cox and, and some other companies, I hated that when, oh, the vendor, like, I hate that. Like if you're being, if, if somebody is calling you a vendor, you're not doing your job at some point, it needs to be like my, my trusted advisor, or, you know, I would, they would call me at, 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 at it got to a point with some of my stories that they would call me in when they were doing media buys and TV buys and all these other stuff because they saw the, that I was bringing a lot more value than just the product that I was representing. And when you get to that level, mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? When you get to that level, um, you know that you're, you, you have a lot more influence, but you'll, you'll never be that guy if you're just worried about your specific product, your little silo, and then you're you're trying to lock dealers into these contracts with these stupid clauses. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we'll put that, we'll put the, uh, the link to the blog post in the show notes and in the video description, if you're watching us on YouTube. So make sure to go in and check it out. <laughs>
<laughs> but I, what I, my argument is like the the real muscle car uh, guy or gal, they're not going to fall for that, dude. Like the noise is it? The, if you don't feel the power and the vibration and the rumbling and the imperfection um, of 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 ice, you, Con conceptually, it, it's flawed. If that's the question, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Would you buy one? What's that? Would you buy one? Would I buy a, a charger? An EV muscle car. If it just had the noise and it didn't have like the. No, the I, I think you're missing the point of a muscle car. Um, <laughs> you know, exactly. I, I'm all about the EV and I'm all about muscle cars. But to me, you got to have one of each. I don't, I don't think you blend the two. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates, and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealer talk. That's foureyes.io slash dealer talk. Yeah, I agree. And that's going to become my, my, my prediction is that's going to become a differentiator. And I was saying earlier before you hopped on that, like, the CJDR brand is going to be one that's going to be able to capitalize and uh, capitalize on that from a marketing perspective because, you know, I think their their line is you know has a lot of um, culture like elements like Jeeps, you know, muscle cars, certain yes. trucks that no EV is going to be able to replicate, and consumers are still going to gravitate towards those um, those options. So. Yeah, I think I told you guys, you know, a lot of my experiences with the Audi brand and, you know, Audi's going to build plenty of electric vehicles, uh, 20 models by 2026, but they're going to continue to build their RS models, which are their high performance gas, mm -hmm. gas guzzlers, for lack of better um, terminology. And, and again, you know, people that want that car are going to buy that car and, you know, hopefully they have that car and then they have an EV in the garage as well. But um, right. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a, con, you know, a, a, a absolute crossover. But as we know, you know, motorsports are going to electric vehicles as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we'll, we'll see where it takes us. But it, it, it's it's pretty exciting right now. It's funny. I saw um, um, the Alpha Dog post uh, uh, something on LinkedIn the other day. And it's like, so what do you do when you take your electric car on a on a like a trip while well, you put your electric charger on the back with two cans of gasoline <laughs> <laughs> oh like, that's that's pretty funny a gasoline powered generator yeah so you can <laughs> charge your car <laughs> is uh is is dealer talk um anti-battery no 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 we 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 explore both i actually drive an, uh, an electric vehicle charity is more of a um, I'm a muscle a, car. Yeah, she likes Jeeps and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just an interesting perspective when we first started the show because we this season we're doing this segment of automotive news and then we talk about a blog post and it's been all EV right in the news lately. So <laughs> we got to like, episode four and I was like, dude, no more. We're not talking about EVs anymore. <laughs> Trying to find the news in the automotive space that's not EV right now is fun. Yeah. yeah. It's an adventure. So, but we did want to actually, this is a good segue because we did want to pick your brain on it. Um, I know you're part of a committee and you're, you're pretty involved in it from what, from, from, you know, your resume and stuff. What, um, what's your take on it, man? Do you think that we're going to, I, I guess my biggest question when it comes to EVs, do you think that we're going to be able to hit those benchmarks of, uh, you know, production and conversion? Um, or do you think that some of those things are, are yet to be determined? Well, I, I think there's benchmarks that are worthy of, of trying to um, attain. I think following California's agenda is aggressive and, and I don't mm -hmm. think the infrastructure is there. Um, so, you know, Colorado recently backed off uh, trying to follow California's aggressive uh, stance on, on battery cars. So I think it's going to go that way. You know, what we're seeing right now, certainly with our Toyota brand and with our Audi brand, is you know right now the recommendation is to buy a hybrid. It's kind of the best of both worlds. It takes care of the mm -hmm. biggest issues that people have when considering an electric car, and that's range anxiety. Um, you know, let's agree that electric cars and range and all that right now isn't for everybody. So when we talk to a consumer, we ask what their needs are, and you know, quite frankly, you could easily say you know the you might be ready and you might want it, but the infrastructure, 
uh, isn't isn't quite there yet. I see a day. I, I think um, Cherry said one of the questions is five years from now. How do you see things? And you know, I think the new norm will be four to five hundred or four to five hundred miles range, um, and then that's equivalent to a full tank of gas. And by the time that technology gets to that level in most cars, I think the charging infrastructure will be there, and they'll certainly Better. work out some of the challenges with battery production. You know, so it's great being uh, trying to wean ourselves off fossil fuels and foreign oil, but right mm -hmm. now we're, we're relying on foreign minerals and, and other products. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to, I think it's going to level out and the, the, the call to get to the end result is going to slow, but I think ultimately we will in fact get there. Did that answer the question in a long, weird way? <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. And, and um, it kind of segues me into, into another uh, portion of it, which is, um, you know, just based on your, on, on, on kind of how you see things, do you think that, well, it's kind of a two part question. One, do you think that we're going to see a decrease in gas prices or do you think they're going to pretty much stay at these levels? And then two, if that's the case, um, if they do adjust, do you think that it's going to slow down the EV push? Because there's no question that the gas increase and this, this EV, um, um, you know, demand has, has kind of, you know, kind of merged at the, at the perfect time. I don't know. That's my take. That's my opinion. That's why I switched, you know? So, um, and I drive with my, with my electric car, I drive four hours a day. So two hours one way, two hours back. And I haven't had any issues charging or anything like that. It's been, it's been, it's been perfect. And I don't have to stop and put gas in the car or anything like that. So I don't know. What, what, what do you think? Am I allowed to ask what EV you have? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, a Tesla. I have the Model Y long range. Nice. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So to answer the, the gas question, you know, as long as we've been in the car business and some of us have been in it for a long time, gas prices have gone up and down and fluctuated back and forth. Um, you know, we even saw in this last round a, a buildup and a, a high supply of, of full-size pickups. Not, And that didn't convert to people buying EVs. It just meant they didn't want to buy big full-size trucks at the moment because gas prices were high. So at $5 a gallon or five plus a gallon, I think it would have an impact. Um, now that we're back to Colorado is like, you know, $3 and change. That's normalized things. So um, I think I think more people are going towards EVs for some of the other reasons. You know, I think in the beginning, it was primarily driven by tax incentives. Um, that was a big driver for people. We know that that's recently gone away. So I think more people are doing it perhaps for environmental reason or greenhouse gas reasons um, and saving money at the pump, like the tax incentives is a benefit to the technology, but it's not entirely a big driver. You know, as we start going down the road and having more affordable models, let's agree that the person buying a $90,000 EV and it's one of their four or five cars, okay, they don't care about gas prices, they're gonna buy gas anyway, and they probably don't care about $7,500 federal tax credit. But, right. you know, as we start making thirty and forty thousand dollar EVs and incentivizing uh, the, the, the secondary market of EV cars, um, I, I think all these things will come into play. So um, if we want to talk about the most recent, um, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, um, I think the rollout was horrible. I think the long term huh. agenda and plan is admirable. Um, I think giving the super wealthy of $7,500 tax credit on a $90,000 car is silly. Um, mm -hmm. In our particular case, we had hundreds and hundreds of orders of EV cars. And when we quote them, when they ordered the car, there was a $7,500 federal tax credit. And now there's not. And that, that, that mm -hmm. is, in fact, a problem. When you look at the Volkswagen ID4, an MSRP of around 40 grand, you take away a $7,500 incentive on that car. And that's the difference between whether they actually buy it or don't. So... I, I think that we, like a lot of government actions, I think we put the brakes on the EV movement uh, by the way that was rolled out. I think they should have grandfathered people in that had already ordered a car. This could have been a January 1 um, initiative. And then, you know, by second quarter of 2023, if it's not built or, or uh, parts content coming from the United States, then you lose some, or North America, I'm sorry, you lose some tax benefits. So, um, Again, think, things are changing, but I, I think gas prices 
Gas prices on the secondary market might be a driver for people to consider the technology. In other words, pre-owned EVs. I don't think it's a big driver for people buying new cars. At three dollars a gallon, so, at five, six dollars a gallon, it's a thing. So if it fluctuates, if it if it were to remain at the five dollar price, and it'd be more of an impact. But as as it comes back down, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, now on the on the incentive side, do you think that um, this? I mean, you could, you, obviously, you, you mentioned that the the the, the package. Um, I think one of the, and I'm paraphrasing here, but one of the incentives was for it had to be produced in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that that's, do you think that's a good thing, uh, or do you think that they that that should have been open? Because obviously, that might slow down. You know, well, yeah, and the other well, thing about well, that that I thought was really interesting is, I wonder how many people are going to shift manufacturing to the U.S. because of that that weren't originally, and do you think that that's going to be something that people, uh, manufacturers start doing? So uh, to clarify, it's North America. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, some manufacturers have plants in in, in uh, Mexico. So they Mexico, yeah, yeah, correct. Um, yeah. But again, if, if they told manufacturers by January of 2024, if you don't produce or assemble cars in the United States, you're not gonna get the benefit, then ma manufacturers would probably adapt and roll and consider, but you can't build factories in a year. Mm -hmm. So. Um, again, I think the, the, the long-term goal is admirable, but to, 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 to make it effective on whatever it was, September 4th is, was, was crazy. Um, but again, it puts dealers in a weird spot because our, um, Q5 hybrid, which is our highest volume Audi product sold. So forever it was the Q5, our highest volume car, the last two years, it switched to the Q5 hybrid. Again, it's the best of both worlds. It takes care of range anxiety. It addresses uh, greenhouse gases and emissions. Um, it means you're buying less gas. So that's a great Band-Aid car until we wait for the infrastructure. That car is made in Mexico. So that car would, in fact, qualify. But now someone might not qualify because they make more than 150 grand a year. So we're really doing this tightrope on where it's built. Does it qualify? Does the household incomes qualify? Are they married? Are they not married? Um, you know, we even had people that aren't married but live together. So is that a combined household income or is it not, right? Um, again, I, I, I like the thought process of the direction they were going. I just am mortified by the rollout. Now, we talk about infrastructure, too, and, uh, uh, you know, charging, as you said, obviously, that's a that's a big one. And, you know, we 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 shared some some data here that that uh, from some research that we were doing and it was i mean we're talking about billions of dollars to get it to a place where by but to hit those metrics of 2030 and i don't know i'm a little bit hesitant of that especially if we don't have more private uh funding for those efforts uh so we'll see time will tell but um you brought up a good point as the cost comes down like i just read that equinox is uh launching a thirty thousand um, EV version. Um, so obviously that's going to make it more affordable. Um, and if the demand continues, um, and we see more and more of those, do you think that on the dealer side, the infrastructure, um, that we're ready to handle, like if, if we get to, you know, 30, 40%, um, uh, adoption, do you think that at the dealership level, we're ready to handle that? Or that's something that also needs to, you know, we're not really equipped right now to to take care of. Yeah, you know, we've been having these discussions since around mid 2018. So, you know, at one point the uh, the dealer body was under attack, saying that we weren't interested in selling EV cars, right? So we in Colorado we actually um, fought that fight, uh, and we won. Uh, it was Senate Bill 167, which would allow manufacturers to sell direct to consumer, similar to the Tesla model. Um, you know, but at that point, EVs made up less than 1% of the total market share of, of car sales. So you're not going to get our attention at below 1%. Uh, state of Colorado at the close of August was now at 6% market share as EV, uh, one of the higher in the nation. Um, so, you know, whether dealers adopted or got the concept early on, you know, 18, 19, 20, if they haven't figured it out now, based off the the initiatives of the manufacturers, then um, then they're they're in big trouble, because um, 
the, you know, even if the dealer isn't quite prepared, the manufacturer is going to make sure that we are prepared. Uh, you know, our company spent over seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in infrastructure, uh, mm. chargers, technician training, um, building sheds for the old batteries. So um, and again, not because we want to spend the money on it, because we think it's absolutely positively going in that direction and we're not going to be caught flat footed. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that, Did we that's lose priority. Uh, yeah, I think she um, she'll she'll jump back in here okay. in a minute. Um, so I think that we don't have I, I think that's an issue, man. I think that especially now, like some of the groups that I work with are stocking up on these cars or selling them, but they don't have like charging ports. Right. Yeah. And so um, a lot of customers, you know, that might be something that you want to, you know, you want to have more of. And then do you have like we all know the shortage of technicians and how difficult that's been. Do, are we staffing up for for that? Um, for those customers to come back, you know what I mean? And service their vehicles with us because obviously, you know, and, and I think dealers already in some cases miss a lot of opportunity by, you know, I know a lot of stores that Toyota in particular that they just turn business away. And I'm just going to say it because I see it all the time. Like they'll, they'll sell used cars, but when that customer wants to service, they really, they're only focused on the Toyota car because they're trying to hit their retention and president's award and all this other stuff. Um, and if they're at capacity, then all these other customers just, you know, they just, they suffer. And so I don't know, man, like I, it, th that seems like a, like a big problem and we need to, um, start thinking about how we're going to address that. I don't know. It's just my opinion, but yeah, um, I mean, you know, th there are a lot of, uh, incentives out there. So we've been, uh, partners with Excel energy here in Colorado from the very beginning. And, and they've, um, they flipped the bill and partnered with us on building, on our own property charging station so we buy the actual charger but they've done all the infrastructure and all the digging up the ground and going to the transformers so um they had a program and we jumped all over it we're, we're currently um we spent probably three four hundred grand so far and right now we have another half a million dollars in in on-campus uh charging infrastructure which at some point will open up to clients and it'll be a revenue stream so right we, we know evs are probably going to affect uh, engine rebuilds at some point, not for the next mm -hmm. 10 years. We'll still have plenty of ice cars to repair, um, mm -hmm. you know, but some of these other revenue streams, which would be a, a charging uh, stream or revenue stream, perhaps, um, you know, over the air uh, updates and that sort of thing. So, you know, when we first heard about the EV, we were worried about not not fixing engines anymore. Right. And I, I think we've all moved past that. Now we just have to uh, to uh, to adapt to to what's happening. But um, there's, there's no doubt it's, it's going to happen. I just, I don't think it's going to happen as fast as everyone thought it would. Thanks. I think we got about yeah. 10 years of doing engine repairs plus, right? The average oh, yeah. age of a car is 12 years. So 12 years now. Yeah. we got plenty of time. By the time it gets real bad, I'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> so you, you bring up another point that I wanted to pick your brain on. So you talked about over the air, um, uh, products, I'm assuming subscription. Correct. So that's a big one for me, man. Because are it, one of the things Herb likes to talk a lot about. Yeah, because I think it's the future. I think, like again, I you know, like I mentioned, I own the Tesla. It's been super convenient. Like I don't carry a key. Everything is done through my phone. I can buy upgrades. I get uh, you know the system upgrades automatically, and then I can buy upgrades to enhance the performance of the car. I think yeah. it's brilliant. I think that. You know, the future is going to be, uh, um, a, uh, um, how do I say, like a base model that comes in with n with nothing, kind of like Porsche does. And then you can subscribe to all these different things and turn that car into like, you know, super duper awesome, right? By buying all these different subscriptions. Yep. I think the biggest, I, the biggest challenge is going to be who's going to benefit from that. Is it going to be the dealer or the OEM or is it going to be a mixture of the two? I mean, dealers have been super resilient if you look at history, right? At some point, service departments weren't a profit center. Um, finance departments weren't a profit center. And look, all, all these things that dealers have done to, to transform that. Like if one thing is for sure, is they're going to figure out a way to navigate in this, in whatever this new world looks like. Um, and I think subscription makes the perfect sense for dealers to turn those into um, high producing revenue streams. I don't know. It's just my opinion. It's my take. We'll see the, uh, you know, um, 
time will tell. But I I hate the idea of subscriptions. Why? I think it's beautiful. I hate it. But I'm pretty old school. Like I want. Well, Charity, there. We, we should clarify the two different you know subscriptions the the one mm-hmm. would be like a software upgrade on a car you already own mm-hmm. and then there's a, the subscription model that suggests you know partial ownership mm-hmm. um and the partial ownership i would agree with you that um volvo tried it and and it really didn't work um, yeah not a fan of that you know either. i think it depends upon the demographic but i think generally speaking you know this notion that you pay 800 dollars a month and switch out a car and try different stuff all the time conceptually perhaps but what what we've seen is the take rate on that is incredibly incredibly low Mm -hmm. so i think that subscription model of you don't buy a car you just borrow one for a month or two i think it's flawed and it's going to have a really low take rate Mm -hmm. on the subscription in regards to you buy a base model car and if you want to give it some more juice for six months you can simply buy it if you get too many tickets you can cancel it like that's that's a thing um and and i think that's going to be more of a thing so we have a Polestar franchise um, and, you know, we do, uh, my wife actually drives a Polestar and, you know, they're doing software upgrades to that car frequently. And it just tells you a software upgrades available. And when they do it, you can see that you're getting a few more miles per tank, or you can see the performance improves a little bit, um, which is, which is pretty cool. So that type of subscription and buy technology as needed, I, I think that could easily be a thing. Who, who makes the profit on that? As long as manufacturer is going to maintain the franchise model, it's going to have to be a, a shared revenue stream. And that's what it's been forever. And obviously, we're pretty passionate about the, the franchise model. You know, sure. the reality is if you want adaptation of this technology, the actual the absolute best way to get it to, to the mass market is through the franchise dealers. Mm-hmm. Well, and imagine what that's going to do for test drives alone, man. You're out. You, you, just imagine this scenario for a second. You take a car. It's like you're doing your test drive with your customer. It's like, hey, Mr. Customer, this is, you know, this is the base model. But um, let's, you, you know, you can get all these different enhancements and then you just turn them on during the test drive and the customer can immediately feel the difference. Like that's no brainer. Like, sure, sign me up. Like, what's it going to cost me? An extra $200 or whatever? Yeah, sure. You are um, a visionary, aren't you? <laughs> I th- I think that's going to be awesome. I just think that's going to be incredible if if we go to that. And again, I from my experience with my own car, it's been like, dude, this is amazing. Like the fact that that we don't have, forget about the 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 fact that it's EV, but I think that now we should have that. Like no keys. How convenient is that? Like just manage your car through your phone. Like it should be in this in 2022. Everybody should be should have at least that portion. See, I, and I, I hate it. Like- I absolutely hate that. Like, what happens if you lose your phone? I like, I, I'm just old at heart, I guess. I want a key. <laughs> I want to feel it. I want it. <laughs> I yeah, break it's- my phone constantly. I it, like currently it's got a massive crack right down the middle of it. And what happens if I break my phone and now I can't? Well, but you, I'm you out still have like nowhere. And now I don't have a key to get into my car because my phone just died. And yeah, then they're screwed. Like, How I, many apps do you have? Like, You probably pay all your bills out of your phone. It's the same see, thing. But we've know. had this discussion before. I don't. Like, I well, don't yeah. have a lot of apps on my phone. I don't. I'm pretty well, old. Well, you, you just Charity, won't be invited. Charity, if you were 12, I would say this might be a problem. But I think, <laughs> I think we... <laughs> I think in your lifetime, uh, in your lifetime, in our lifetime, we're, if, if you don't want that technology, you're going to have the option to use it or not use it. You know, okay, I, I, okay. I think it, that being the the only choice is is so far away that um, I think you're OK. Good. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be driving a gas car forever. Yeah. And, and that's that's the cool part is that that will be available for quite quite a while to to those of us that. That still want that. Mm-hmm. Right on. So moving things along here, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, especially because yeah, you have access to all these different um, stores, is um, what are you seeing now uh, for the rest of this of this year? I mean, first it seems like first quarter was really good. Second quarter we started to see a little bit of some some dips, some you know. Um, just uh, for me, what how I can describe it is a lot of digital traffic, not so much in-store traffic. So definitely things are getting a little bit more 
difficult. I think customers are waiting a little bit more. They're more willing to order their vehicle. And that's become, I mean, after two years of, of these, of this new norm, if you will, um, uh, behaviors have started to shift, but, um, also now there's all this financial pressure and all these other things that are starting to catch up. What do you think the last, um, the remaining of Q3 and then Q4 is going to look like? I think it depends upon manufacturer, um, you know, but the reality is, is we retrain the consumer, whether it's an automotive consumer or an appliance or couch consumer. I mean, we ordered couches and waited nine months for them. You mm -hmm. know, that was, that was unheard of. So I think consumers are now um, realizing that, you know, it's not instant gratification. So we recently did a radio campaign on this is what's going on on the, you know, the supply chain shortage. But, you know, as a consumer, how can you make this work for you? And the reality is, is the old day, you know, we used to sell cars that we needed to sell and hope they'd buy it, right? And mm -hmm. if it had something they didn't want, we discount it. And we did this whole thing of, of perhaps having them buy something that wasn't ideal because we we're under immense pressure from manufacturers, so forth and so on. And now what we're seeing is people know they're going to wait because of the supply chain on the new car. There, there's no no scariness about, oh, my trade's worth 20 grand now. What will it be worth in three months when my car comes in? Well, probably 20 maybe 21, right? So the trade values aren't going down. So now it's just slow your roll. Let's order exactly what you want. Um, they're paying MSRP or above in most cases. So let's slow the roll. Let's get it 100% right. Let's lock you in on your trade value. Um, the only misnomer right now or the, the, you know, the, uh, the unknown is, is interest rates, right? Because they keep climbing. But other than that, um, it's a pretty safe buy, buying environment for the consumer. So when I said it depends upon brands, um, you know, when Audi and VW were in real rough shape, it seemed like our Mazda store had plenty of inventory, Mazda and Hyundai. And now we're starting to see our inventories improve on the German brands, specifically VW and Audi. Toyota's tough um, and Mazda in our Hyundai store in big trouble and Volvo's somewhere in between. Um, but when 85 percent of your cars that come off a truck are already sold, mm -hmm. um, that's that's a that's a good problem. So we're doing less volume. Uh, customers are maintaining better values on their car because there's not too many cars in the marketplace. You know, my hope long term is 18, 19. There were too many cars in the market. It was a race to the bottom and the, 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 the cheapest dealer won. Right. Yeah. Um, now. Now that's that's certainly not the case. And I think back then manufacturers are spending 46, 4700 a copy to incentivize a car to get it over the curb. So somewhere between oversupply and undersupply where we're at now is going to be the happy median. I mean, I've heard from Audi that a 30 day supply is more likely what we're going to have on the ground, which is 140 cars. Where back in the day I had 400 on the ground. Right. Carrying costs, potential hail damage. All kinds of liabilities go along with that. So I think this new model of uh, having a lot of cars pre-sold before they come in, having a lower day supply, it's going to protect the dealer from liabilities. Mm -hmm. It's going to protect the consumer from resale values. You know, a car that's $10,000 off when it's brand new doesn't mean you got a good deal. It means it wasn't worth what they were asking in the first place. And so yeah, exactly. um, I, think we've, I think we've done a lot of market correction to the point where it's going to it's going to make the industry a little bit healthier and it might get us down the road that there's map pricing on cars and the price of the car is the price of the car. It doesn't matter who you buy it from. So now the transaction between the consumer and the dealer has more to do with proximity to their home or office and maybe the personality at the dealership, mm -hmm. not, not what you're going to sell the car for. The only, the only variable there would be, you know, if, if the one store is going to give them 500 more for the trade than the other. But we all know yeah. that store will step up to it. I think transaction prices on new cars five years from now will most likely be standardized. That would be amazing, dude. Yep. That's an industry that I want to see for sure on so many for so many different things, but mainly because uh, dealers have been super transparent with their pricing to the point where they're one of the industries that you have to like almost tell the customer, this is how much the vehicle cost me during negotiation until the pandemic happened. Before they, you know, so that they, it was just, it's just ridiculous. And um, now my biggest concern has been like, okay, are we going to go back? Are we going to go back to a situation where we're forced to do that? Because yeah, I mean, there's, there's, we have the, the, 
the advantages of the current situation. But as soon as one, um, as soon as one um, brand or one OEM gets to those levels, that everybody needs to follow suit. Otherwise, they're going to dominate the market. Right? There's going to be too. It's going to be too big of a value proposition of like, hey, I have 200 cars available for sale versus not. So that's been a concern. But I want to talk about something that you mentioned, um, and it has to do with the financial. And I'm not an economist. These, this is just the, you know, these are just my thoughts. But to me, the only way to to pump the brakes in the economy right now is through interest rate hikes because they they're where they're at right now, nine percent or whatever, and the, and and it really hasn't moved the needle much. So I do foresee that there's going to be another round of this, and my mind goes to, well, if that happens, how much more difficult is it going to be to put people in, in a car and what impact is that going to have on the industry? So let's say between now and the end of the year, that happens. What, what should we do um, as dealerships? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, and, and I don't have an answer for it. Um, you know, what we know is there's a big segment of the consumers that are buying cars that are insulated from interest rates, right? higher, it doesn't matter, pay cash, or even if it's uh -huh. a little bit higher, they can absorb the extra payment. And when it when the rates go down, they'll refinance. Um, I think it's going to hit people hard that are on a budget. And that's a, that's a big part of the consumers, right? Um, so of that of that public, you know, a lot of them will just table their purchase because they can't afford it based off the new rates. But then we have the whole bunch of people that can't afford it. And it's not a want, it's a need. And, you know, they're the ones that are going to get hit and they're the ones that can afford to get hit the least. So um, don't really yeah. have an answer. Uh, you know, we all know why the feds raise rates and it's the, it's the slow things down and stabilize things. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest driver is, is the housing market as well as, um, uh, you know, consumer confidence. So, you know, we got midterm elections going on. You know, we don't even talk about Ukraine anymore. I was more concerned about Ukraine having an overall impact, but boy, that war is still going on. It doesn't even make the headlines anymore. So, you know, I think we need to get past these midterms. We've got to have some, have some stabilization uh, and uh, within the, the, the government. Um, and then the supply chain thing needs to get a little bit better. And then I think rates will normalize. But, you know, some of us, we used to, we used to sell cars at 14, 15, 16, 17%. So when yeah. I hear people talk about rates are high at five, yeah. Uh, what are you talking you know? about? Yeah, right. You're like, dude, so, come on now. <laughs> again, again, the car industry, we've seen all this time and time again. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's going to be ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys. And, and you know, it, it just is what it is. Right. The, yeah. The best no, thing I mean, is, I is con the manufacturers are forced to make better products. And the Tesla model has had every single regular franchise dealer on their heels, right? The market share that they've gained now now i see manufacturers you know just doing things because well that's what tesla does so it obviously works and when you talk about pricing it works there mm -hmm. isn't negotiations go to the apple store what's the iphone cost right some of the best products in the world you don't do what the auto industry has been doing that's why i think either map pricing or standardized pricing whatever you want to call it is probably going to be a thing. And if no one ever did it before in the automotive sector, it'd be scary. But the, yeah. the, the company that's done it, that's pilfered market share from every single one of the big, big boys over the last 10 years. You know, I get frustrated when manufacturers say, oh, we want to do this or, you know, this online buying because they see it work for Tesla. Therefore, we can we can just pull a lever and do it. Well, not necessarily. Tesla was successful for a whole bunch of reasons. It's not it's not one price. It's not the online yeah. presence. It, it was this mysterious, cool way of buying a car and it just took off. We can pivot and adapt and, and duplicate some of it, but we can also celebrate the fact that we're not Tesla and we are part of a, mm -hmm. a dealer body. And we do have, you know, uh, a network of service facilities and providers. There, there's upsides to, to the franchise model as well, as long as we don't turn into a Best Buy and don't adapt, right? Best Buy had a chance to buy Netflix back in the day. Do you guys hear that? Right. Yeah. So uh, the, the the automotive industry just can't turn into a Best Buy, and 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 I don't mean I don't mean Best Buy, Blockbuster. Sorry. Blockbuster. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I don't think we yeah. will. What we've seen already, and and how they're pivoting and changing, it's the changes that are happening right now are going to be better for the industry and better for the consumer. And I don't know what else you could ask for when you hit some adversity.
to, yeah, no question about yeah, that. I mean, I think sure. this whole, and I've said it multiple times on the show, one of the things that I loved about this, and it's weird to say that because it was such a, a weird negative, you know, global issue with this pandemic, but man, did it have some positive impacts for our industry that, that are not even, haven't even happened yet. Just on the, on the progress side, the fact that we're more willing to do oh, and yeah. think outside of the box and try new things. And it's been accelerated times 10. I think that that's going to reap benefits for this industry for years to come. And we haven't even started to see the, 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 the impacts of that yet. Well, mo so, most of the changes are, are, are consumer like friendly. So thank God. Yeah, for sure. And I liked, uh, you know, um, the, the, I liked that you, you talked about Apple and I, I just want to make one, one reference really quick is, and it has to do with dealership websites, like the experience part, that's the differentiator. And we talk about this experience concept in our last episode. I got a little bit heated and passionate with that, with that topic, but it's like, um, dude, look at, look at just how, how your digital experience is. If it, if you can go to 10 different dealerships and it, and it looks similar or it feels like the same experience, then you don't have an experience, right? So, um, I think that's a big one. And that's why Apple can, uh, can do the just buy button. They don't have to have four or five different widgets. They don't have to have all these different things to try to get your lead so I can, you know, call you and um, the, the, they don't need it. You know, right. they just have one call to action. Are you ready to buy this car now or this phone now? If yes, buy now, click the buy. And if not, do all your information and all the perusing that you want. And then, you know, when you're ready, come back. Well, and then you get the, when you have the standardized pricing, I mean, it, it all becomes about experience because right. you aren't going to get those customers who say, I've got five dealerships that I'm looking at and whoever gives me the best price, you're not going to have now it. Now brand, now your brand message needs to be mm -hmm. tight because now it's about like, okay, I can get the same car, the, 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 it's a commodity. I can get it anywhere. You know, like, like Steve mentioned, it's about convenience. What's the closest to me. But if that dealership has bad reputation and all these other negatives, mm -hmm. then, you know, they're going to suffer. So I ran into a customer the other day that asked me, um, what do I get with that market adjustment that you've got on there? <laughs> 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 I really wanted to say you get the car, get the car. <laughs> <laughs> but he full on expected that we were going to give an added value because we were asking for more yeah. on the price of the vehicle. How, how much were you asking and what kind of car? Toyota 5,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, good or bad. Our company does not believe in market adjustments. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really good, man. You know, our competitors say, Steve, they'll pay it. And I understand they'll pay it, but they'll, often they'll remember paying it. So yes. yeah. mm -hmm. we've been doing a, on, on certain models in Audi land, the, uh, the RS models, you know, my competitors were 15 or 20 grand over sticker. We did five grand over sticker, but we have a uh, pretty um, extensive uh, ceramic coat process. Uh, it's a seven year ceramic coat, it costs us 1800 bucks. So that is, um, uh, that's the pre, added value you're giving it's pre-installed on all cars it's five grand not 15 or 20 and they, they're getting something for 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 their for their uh for their premium and for us that was that was a so we do it on the prius prime uh but on on most of our models we just don't charge over sticker on some of those exclude because my customer could buy it for me at sticker and flip it in a day and make 10 grand yeah that didn't feel right either so mm -hmm. uh at five grand over uh with a uh $3,200 markup on ceramic coating. If they want to do that, I, I suppose that's their, their prerogative. But uh, as a company, you know, we're a long-term vision. And, and I think some of that over sticker is, is short-term. And I understand people will pay it. But I think if you're in the game for the long, long-term, it's probably not the best practice. Yeah, we've talked about that on here before. Yeah, too. we have. And I, I listen, I get why dealers do it. Supply and demand 101, in my opinion. And, and and in some cases, you should. Like, you have certain models or whatever that just, that it's just the only one or whatever. You know what I mean? But I've also said that customers, to Steve's point, customers are not going to forget that, man. And when it mm -hmm. comes for, to that next car, because they might have bought that car in a necessity because it wasn't a want, it was a need at the time, and it was closest or whatever, and you had the car and they had to eat it and pay it. But they're not going to forget that, and the and dealerships can can leverage that. They can be like, "Hey, you got you got in a bad deal during COVID because your dealer charged you market adjustment. 
and that's going to be a po very powerful message. Yep. So, well, um, I mean, on the flip side for the consumers, like no one felt bad for us in 1819 when we sold, you know, 140 cars a month at five grand or 500 back of invoice. Right. right? But that's a manufacturer overbuilding scenario that that's not the consumer's fault. So I've heard people say, oh, yeah, well, no one felt bad for us when we were making 200 a copy. That's not the, that's not on the consumer. That's on your manufacturer for building too many cars. True. That's a good point. That's yeah. a good point. Anyway, Steve, thank you so much for doing this, man. We really appreciate it. Um, lots pleasure. of good insights here. Excited to share this episode with everybody. Um, there is one question that we ask everybody that comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? Okay. So unfortunately, I knew that question was coming. So we kind of talked about it. I believe um, standardized pricing is going to be uh, more of a norm. Um, I believe five years uh, hybrid technology might be the number one driver. Um, I don't think it's going to be fully electric um, this early on. Um, I think hybrid is the way to go while we build up the infrastructure and um, work on battery technology and range. So two things, five years would be um, hybrid and standardized pricing, which would be both of those are in the benefit of the consumer. All right, folks, there you have it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, Mr. Steve Powers, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for uh, sharing your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. Make sure to go to the show notes. We're going to put all um, anywhere you can uh, uh, get in touch with Steve. If you want to look at the blog post we talked about earlier, and then anything that we covered on the news that's uh, that we can link in there, um, you can check it out there too. That's all the time that we have for today. And as usual, we'll talk later. We only host the well respected. The vendor Lexus Nexus, we don't sell digital marketing. What you do? We inspected with our DT vendor management. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealer talk. That's foureyes.io slash dealer talk.